All right, I'm going to get started. Welcome to the 217th meeting of the New York Linux Users Group, the latest in our monthly meetings. Tonight we have Daniel Reek, who will be giving us a talk called A Graybeard's Worst Nightmare, How Containers and Kubernetes Redefine the GNU Linux Operating System. Uh, I'd like to say how much we appreciate our sponsor, Two Sigma, uh, for continuing to provide this lovely space. Uh, and thank you to everyone here for taking the opportunity to join us tonight. Uh, tonight, before we get started, uh, we have our usual requests. Please silence your phones. Please do not eat any snacks in noisy wrappers during the presentation. Uh, and please use the mic for questions so you can be heard in the recording. Uh, so I'd like to repeat our thanks for Two Sigma uh, and acknowledge our other sponsors past and present, including Bloomberg, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and Pearson for their support. In addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed over the years. Uh, speaking of volunteers, uh, we have a uh, regular workshop scheduled. Uh, Hannah, can you please raise your hand there in the back? Um, Afterwards, if you'd like to know more about our workshop, Hannah's here to talk. Uh, she's also looking for help uh, and volunteers to help organize the workshops. They're happening these days at the NYU Silver Building, room 512, uh, 32 Waverly Place. Uh, and the next workshop is Tuesday, July 3rd from 7 to 9 p.m. and is on the NYLUG page uh, on Meetup. The next general meeting for NYLUG will be July 18th here at Two Sigma and will feature David Ravaman or Raveman, I'm not, could be a rave man, it could be Raveman, I'm not really sure yet. Uh, from Google, who will be talking about Crostini and bringing Linux applications to Chrome OS with proper UX integration and all the security benefits intact. Sounds like a cool talk. Uh, the listing is on meetup.com and RSVPs will be open on the 4th of July. After the presentation, we'll be heading to the Cupping Room Cafe uh, for drinks and chats and whatnot. Uh, 259 West Broadway, two blocks east of here, follow me. I'm usually there drinking first. Um, final reminders, silence your phones, put away the loud wrappers, use the mics for questions at the end. Okay, on to the talk. Daniel Reek leads the Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence in the office of the CTO at Red Hat, which is tasked with advancing the adoption of AI across Red Hat's products, services, and communities. Before that, Daniel most recently managed a cross-product group and was deeply involved in, uh, sorry, deeply involved in Red Hat's broader container and platform strategy. Daniel has been in the open source business since co-founding ID Pro, one of the early Linux startups in Europe in 1996. And he also led product management for Red Hat Enterprise Linux from 2005 to 2011. Please give a warm welcome to Daniel, giving us a Greybeard's Worst Nightmare. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we can skip the first slide. We already summarized that. That's good. I have too many slides anyway. So usually... Um, so a, a disclaimer, what I talk about here is um, my personal opinion uh, based on a long experience. Um, I will use some Red Hat examples, but it's not Red Hat specific, and it cannot be misconstrued in any official opinion by any current former or future employers of mine. Um, some of the things I say, uh, probably they want uh, deniability. Anyhow, I usually let my beard grow out, but my wife hates it, so I didn't do that this time. Traditionally, when we um, when we look at at the Linux operating and operating systems in general, um, yeah, we look at it from the infrastructure up. That's true for most people in the Linux space, in my experience. It's definitely true, for example, for for Red Hat um, and the the Linux distribution community. Um, I call it the infrastructure view. It's all about enabling hardware and it's machine-centric in a mindset. But there's an alternative view that is application-centric. You look at it from the from the top down, right? It's it's not just like it's not the kernel that that brings up my hardware and gives me drivers to talk to the hardware. Um, it's the user space runtime that lets my application run and gives it stability. And arguably the most important piece is actually the user space view on the operating system um, because it abstracts from the infrastructure and allows you to um, run an application independent of what the specific hardware is, right? That's that at the end, the whole point of an operating system. 
Um, so if you look at the traditional role of GNU Linux, um, you know, like historically, like when 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 you know when we we all were young and 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 computers were new and all that um so before my time uh, we had mainframes right we we had leased hardware um big machines that were controlled by a single entity in general right they were they were like even as a user you didn't own the hardware you made some contract with um with a big company that put that machine in your in your building and then you could um with a service contract access a certain compute capacities on that on that machine right and then you could call them and say, oh, we need more compute capacity, and they could open up more uh, CPUs for you, in, in some of the models at least. And in, in that environment, the hardware was, was usually, not, it was not everyone's business model, but that was one of the predominant business models. Um, the hardware was owned by the vendor you leased it. It uh, was a closed ecosystem. It was black box services. You put your data in there. They were very reliable, but you could never, you would never have any choice. Right? Most people didn't want choice at the time, but um, it, it, it was, was very controlled. Um, and the, the, you know, I, when I, when I talked about that, some, sometimes you say, "Well, you forget microcomputers," but I think microcomputers were just small mainframes, so I'll just ignore them for now. Um, so Unix came along, and we got the concept of open systems. So suddenly we had we had still um, expensive proprietary hardware with a propri proprietary operating system, but you got some choice in in the, on the software side. Right, you could install third-party software on that. Um, that wasn't fully dependent, at least for most of the Unix vendors, it wasn't fully dependent on the vendor approval anymore. Some, some of the Unix vendors still kept the model um, where you know, the tool chain was so locked down that you had to get the approval to write software for the platform. But in general, Unix allowed you to write your own software and, for example, install GNU tools to you know, do whatever you wanted. Um, so you had, like a, a, you had still vertical integration of the infrastructure and the operating system and the tool chain, but you had some uh, more open ecosystem, but it was still very expensive. And then Linux, and in, in Reddit's case, Reddit Enterprise Linux, but there are others, um, came along, and they changed the game here. Because suddenly, well, one way to look at it is that, that you know, Linux made it possible for people who could only afford a PC to run their IT like they could afford Unix servers. Right? That's one way to look at it. But the, the most strategic view is that um, what it allowed you to do is to over freely choose the hardware you were you wanted to use the operating system and the applications right you had a full choice across the ecosystem and you could even dig into every piece of the operating system and a good part of the tool chain most of the tool chain and and many of the applications and change them right because they were open source and that is um that is a, a very big difference. Right? It didn't force you to only use open source. And many of the software, in every you know, the opinion that everyone has a right to publish their software under the license they choose, you know, in compliance with the licenses they use to write the software. But ultimately, you know, even if you run proprietary application, applications on top, you get an even playing field. You have a neutral runtime, and that. Basically, it's the, the core role of Linux, giving you a neutral runtime to run whatever app, software application you want on whatever platform you choose. Um, and you know, today, across, across hardware, um, on the source code level, different hardware architectures, and across the clouds. And the, the, the reason why Linux is predom the predominant operating system in public cloud um, is because you can run the same binaries or you can at least compile from the same source code um, and move that across all these different platforms because you have a stable abstraction of your underlying infrastructure. So that's a core role of the operating system. Now, you know, talking about software binaries, um, you know, how, how do we manage that, right? We deploy, we're talking about deploying software. And like in the beginning, and you know, this was inherited from Unix servers, uh, what, we, what we usually did to deploy applications and, and move them around is we uh, deployed them somewhere in, in a, on a server and mounted that across multiple servers. You know, we had big servers, multiple admins per servers, you know, big sun machines. Um, 
we we did the same thing in Linux, right? We installed software, compiled it on, on a machine, use a local, use tools like Stow to put links uh, into the binary search tree, so and the library to execute things and move versions and things like that. Um, the problem with that model, you know, to to you, so we had a stable abstraction layer, but the the because everything is a moving piece, right? There are software updates all the time. Um, the, the 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 problem you know with this model became that the behavior of your application depended on the state of your software stack on the host on a specific host at the time when you compile and then run and you know if you have um, if you have a, a small number of large servers with multiple admins per server that's doable right but it became a problem um, with the PC the so smaller PC servers that we use with Linux. Right? Because we had too many servers, and you know, keeping all of them in the same state became hard. And that's where things like RPM, Debian packaging, YAM, and apt came from. Well, YAM much later, but uh, that's um, apt. Apt was there early on. Um, you know, the early Linux distributions. The 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 you know, if you remember Slackware, you know, basically was just tar files of binaries, right? Um, solving the problem that. You know, there was probably like 600 to 1,000 packages, right? And figuring out which version works with what and compile it, bootstrap it was too hard. So you got install media that had pre-built binaries and tar files. Problem, you know, you, you would compile and use a local, whatever you wanted in addition to what the distributor put in. And like, you know, they often had like these contrib directories with sources on the DVDs or, or floppy disks. Um, the the problem was that the, the that you couldn't get a good inventory. It was really hard to see what needed to be updated. There was no management. That's what what RPM and Debian packaging all these tools um, solve for for us. They give us a way to package pre-built binaries with re, re um, reproducible behavior. Right? We build on a build machine, then we package up with a manifest, with validation. Um, with you know, preserving the the access rights, all the good stuff, um, the the binary tree of the specific components with a dependency model, saying, oh, if I want to install this, I need this other thing, this underlying library installed, which all the previous approaches didn't didn't have, right? They couldn't manage that dependency. If you compile in user local, you find out when you run the configure script whether whether you have all the dependencies. With RPM, it's pre-compiled. With Debian packaging, is pre-compiled, and you get um, you get the same behavior that you had on the machine where you compiled it and it reproduces the environment through the dependency tree. Um, this was awesome, right? This made, uh, this made Linux deployment scale. Right? Before that, it was a pain. With that, it, it became manageable um, and, and the, the Linux distributions um, became you know, enterprise ready through that, basically. Through this pre uh, redistributability and, and uh, um, reproducibility. Now, there are some side effects that um, you know, both Debian packaging and, and RPM introduce, and probably most others. Right? There, there are exceptions. People try to work around. But one is that there's an implicit lock into a single instance, single version model. Um, so in, in both systems, you can only install one version of every package. If you want to work around it, if you say, I want two versions of an application, like two versions of a runtime environment, the way to do that is you rename the package and relocate it. Right? Um, which, like before, when we compiled and used a local, that wasn't a problem. We could, you know, unless you wanted to link it with Stow into the main search path, the main library path of, of the, the main system, you could, could have different versions of things installed. You, you know, just made sure you kept them in your specific subtree in user local or wherever you did that, or or mount user or whatever where you had your your binary server. Um, with the Linux, I mean, suddenly we are down to like one version of each package can be installed at the same time, or the packager has to account for the case that multiple get installed, and that has a lot of uh, consequences. Um, you know, it, wor it worked fairly well as long as there were small numbers, simple stacks, or you know, just using things that come from the distribution. But it had, you know, we'll see later, it has challenges when you get to a higher complexity. 
Um, it also implemented a line by a late binding model for deploying software um, based on ABI contract. Now, so if you look at that way, so you, compiling user local is very late binding, right? You bind your binary dependencies when you compile the application to the individual host. That was the problem, right? Because differences between hosts, it was too hard to keep them um, consistent, and so there were unexpected behavior as a consequence of late binding to a binary dependency tree. With RPM and Debian packaging, we are late binding the dependencies based on pre-built binaries, right? Which works really well in a normal, um, in, in a small set of dependencies with a medium number of machines. But with software stacks getting more complicated, right? A modern Linux distribution is probably 5,000 components just in the core distribution, not 500 like 15 years ago. Um, or maybe it's even more, I'm not paying that much attention, but it's, it's, like, it's a huge number of packages with a huge number of libraries, which, like, on a, which get updates just for security reasons on a daily basis, right? And then you have to make sure when you deploy things that these dependencies all match one-to-one, -one, right? Because an update... Um, an update to an underlying library that changes the ABI or the API of the component will break your application tree. And so we call that dependency hell. And we probably all have experienced that at one point or the other. And that's because it's a late binding model. You know, when you install it is when you bind the dependency tree and if something changed. And if you have a large cluster, this point when you're done patching, you're going to start over patching from the other end because there's another critical update of some freaking component you're running in there. Um, so that is the, the, the problem we are faced with today, right? It's, it's a huge, huge challenge, right? Now, we got things like Kickstart, Satellite, CF Engine, you know, later Puppet, and then, um, of course, I have to say Ansible, which solves all the problems of the other systems, not the dependency. But uh, you, you get my spin, right? Um, so we got mass deployment, we got recipes, it solved this for a long time, right? It bought us probably seven years on this. Um, and um, have centralized control. You know that all my machines are in the same state. I have dependency tree management. I have, um, uh, uh, I, I have manifest for each machine. I can do it in a declarative model, in a, in a, in a command model. You know, it, 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 it's, it's kind of solved, but you still have dependency hell. It, they didn't solve that. Um, so, we got we got a workaround, which brought us another, well, actually, six seven years, and that is VMs, right? So um, virtual machines basically removed our dependency on hardware, right? and, and you know initially that wasn't a Linux thing, right? On Linux we had like one piece of hardware, we ran multiple applications on each piece of hardware it was not a big deal. In Windows, they couldn't do that for a whole bunch of reasons, or didn't want to do it, or whatever. And I'm not gonna, it's you know. Doesn't matter. They just didn't do it. So they needed VMs to multiplex the hardware. Now we inherited that. And with that, we inherited a different deployment model, which is a VM based model. You know, in theory, everyone was, oh, we're going to do image based deployments with our VMs, right? In reality, no one did that. Well, it's actually, that's not true. You did an image based deployment and then you treated it like a pet and run yum update inside. Um, and, 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 you know, and you got delegation, right? So you, 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 you have this gold image, you give that to the app team and then they're not supposed to do anything with the gold image. You're just adding the application. You know, the third time you try that, you're going to give them the root account on that image and they do whatever they want, right? So image based deployment, then you have, you're back to the same problem. So, but, but it, you know, it kind of, like, because it, it gave you one user space and kernel per application, isolated from the rest, it removed dependency tree to some degree, right? And the, 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 the problem with a multi-application server was that uh, you know, team A wanted this version of, you know, left pad, or team B wanted this other version, but you can only have one version installed in RPM, so what are you going to do, right? With VMs, you give each of them their own VM and they run whatever version of the user space stack they want. And, like, and I don't want to... Um, you know, we have the same problem just um, 
just between projects inside a company like Red Hat, right? Um, you know, the, the satellite team wants this version of some Ruby gem for their UI, and uh, the, the OpenShift team wanted this other version. And then you update that in, and they're both in, like, they both want it shipped in RHEL because they don't want to take the responsibility in their specific program because that's why you have an underlying platform, right? And so RHEL ships it and updates it, and then they break one of them because, you know, Something changed, and everything. so it depends. Yeah, it's a real thing, right? Because you know you can catch it with testing, but it's very expensive, and it requires work, right? So of course, um, you 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 like a, a model where you don't have to have um, different applications coexist in a sim sim in the single kind of dependency namespace, right? Because it with the complexity of stacks became unmanageable, right? Um, the problem, of course, is now we have a new problem called VM sprawl, right? And we have all these VMs that have their own kernel stacks and um, their own versions and vastly different versions of everything. Um, and now you want to have consistent management, consistent backup, consistent monitoring. And there are different operating systems, or different versions of operating systems, things like that. So y you have a lot of overhead because you just inherited 10 times the number of servers, for you know not not physically but virtually right and that's literally the case i got that right i mean so not not a natural english speaker so i'm struggling with some of these um so so yeah so we end up with a lot of um infrastructure elasticity which is awesome with the cloud right we have all these vms um but we inherit this like basically single instance of the full OS stack, including kernel. Um, and, uh, you know, we still do, um, we, 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 we move to like a model where like applications don't need to have clustering anymore. We do that in the platform, right? High availability gets commoditized a little bit, which was like a big problem back in the day with traditional service. Um, as I said, like in theory, you could move images across the the you know you, you could deploy images and update images so you could test an image and then deploy it in reality you're not doing that you're doing the the late binding model still where you where you lock into a production instance and you run an update on the component level which which is if you think about it, that's crazy right um i obsess a little bit on the late binding right because so it was very crazy when you compile things in user local because we're actually compiling code but even with with the the package level deployment, what it means is that you're going to run an update in a test environment for security, an update you have to do because it's, you know, Intel put another like Easter egg in their microcode. And, uh, you know, you, so you have no way around it. You have to deploy this. Otherwise, your auditor is going to like light a fire under your seat. And um, you're going to do that in the running environment with no rollback capability, other than like finding a backup somewhere. Um, and you don't exactly know what happens, because you're totally relying that nothing ever went wrong, like there was not like some cosmic radiation issue that made a bit flip and like it resolves on all the machines. It's a bit crazy, right? And you know, in theory with VMs, we could get around it, but just doing it once and deploying it all, or, or you know, well, back in the day, we there was a there's a very famous, very big database application. I'm not going to name, but everyone knows of. Um, and back in the day, they had this Java installer that was terrible. When you had to run that as a GUI installer on a server, which you know, kind of was weird, but you had to do that. Um, and like it was kind of the equivalent of like almost compiling from source what we did is we um, basically did we did that on a on a test machine then did a binary rpm should just package it in an rpm without the compile part just to have a reproducible distribution of that so you do things like that right you work around it by packaging meta packages that lock down dependencies or you know every i'm pretty sure debian has it but yum has this capability to lock down dependencies now so you do these workarounds to make sure that you like you don't 
do an update and like between you testing this and updating someone imported another security fix in your in your repository server that breaks everything because you didn't test it right so there's these workarounds but you know we still we still have the problem that you know dependency hill is still biting us so so you know, at the same time, we're seeing a whole bunch of changes, right? Um, over the last couple of years, right? There's like everything is software now. Um, so it's not just like the the good old times where like there was an IT department that ran IT, and then everyone else had a terminal and like basically got to type in things. Um, they are over, right? Everyone is the IT department, right? Because there's no, there's nothing in a modern company anymore that's not software defined in one way or the other right um, our business processes are all, all software defined right? um, the heavy equipment has software running in it and like your car is a is a mid-sized data center measured by like the the, the, the standards of the 70s and 80s right? um, actually your phone has more compute power than the Actually, is that true? Yeah, probably it's true. Yeah. So everyone is an IT, walking IT department, and everything is written in software. Every everyone you interact with is writing software. So you know, delegation models really got hard. Right? We have um, uh, different behaviors. Right? We are moving to cloud native, which is a big word, but it, but it basically means you're you're basically not looking at hardware anymore. You're assuming that hardware is fungible and elastic, and you're looking at services, you aggregate services to achieve a goal. So it's a higher level of abstraction. Um, you have um, things like CI, CD, you have DevOps. So, so behavior fundamentally changed, right? We do things very different than from what we did in the past. We also have an explosion in software stack complexity. And I alluded to that, like the Linux distribution is actually a small problem, right? Because like if you look at I said about five thousand packages in the core distribution, right? The whole I think the whole Debian when I checked this um a year ago, so I think the whole Debian ecosystem was if I'm not wrong, thirty thousand or forty thousand packages. You know, Fedora was maybe a third less. Um, well, there are 700,000 almost NPM packages in uh, npmjs.org. And, yeah, I got this off the internet, so it must be true, but um, <laughs> you can check it at modulecounts.com. Or, or, um, but I found this an impressive number, right? Exponential growth in, in just software. And these all can be forks of each other. It doesn't matter. Someone's going to use that. And I, I mentioned LeftPad earlier, right? There was an interesting case where someone deleted a package that everyone was using and a whole bunch of applications died in an update because the dependency just disappeared from the repo. Um, so, so, so we have a change in behavior. Things are faster. There are more people doing software and there's much more software. Right? So dependency hell nowadays, like if, if you go to like Dante's Inferno, like we are, we are pretty much at the like bottom now, right? And the, I don't remember what it was, but it, it, it was gruesome. And, and you know, any, anyone who tries to like build any NPM based application today is painfully aware of this. Right? And, and if, if they really hate you, they use Angular in a Python application and then you have to deal with both and, Right. Um, nothing works out of the box anymore. Um, so you know, the, so, so the, the the traditional Linux distribution is really in trouble with this because like no one can package all of that in a Debian package or RPM package, and like at the time you're done, it's outdated. Right. The uh, you can't manage these dependency trees anymore. You can't even you can't get it right anymore because if you try to package all of this into a late binding dependency tree, at the time you're done with an update, you're going to update again, right? It's it's too many moving pieces. Right? Um, you can't test it reliably anymore. At that level of complexity, and like when you go higher in the software stack, tests become incredibly hard because they depend too much on the specific application. So you can't actually validate that everything works reliably anymore in a single namespace, right? And then, um, of course, there, there are conflicts between all these things. There are different versions that people want to use. Any developer developing wants to use a new thing at the time, you know, the feature set at the time they're developing. Then they hand it off to an ops team, and they probably don't want to touch it anymore because, you know, it is 
done, right? So everything gets a tail, and and uh, you know, you, you, you the, the, in the good old times, which is standardized everything, say here's a gold image, here's the set of libraries you can use, that gets harder and harder and harder, and you know, because your your um, competitive advantage. Um, of your website, of your customer interactions, of your trading, of your, you know, everything in your business depends on your ability to um, scale and, and have feature richness and use the newest features throughout the stack. This becomes impossible to standardize, right? So the traditional model of pre-built binaries with a single namespace, managing dependencies through something like RPM, it's just not going to work anymore, right? It can't scale with this complexity. Um, and it, it also has no value, right? All you would do there, like if you go into NPM or, or, or PyPy, they actually have a package format, right? So repackaging that in a Linux distribution at zero value, it's just a wrapper around something that already does all the same things with dependencies, just in that space, right? So, so there's, there's, like, um, there, there's a huge, huge limitation to what we can do there. Um, and and you, you have this, you know, you have this, conflict implicit in there where you have the people who look at ops and they, they download things to install and update in place, right? That's what you want to do with the operating system. And there's the application view where people download things to build, right? And they, as long as it does what they need for their application goal, they don't care about any long-term consequences and they just throw it over the wall. So you have this, this very different views on it. So there's a solution to that. And based on the title, you kind of knew where I was going, right? Um, so um, the, the, the solution here are containers, right? Which um, it, it, you know, um, Solomon Hikes had this, this tremendous, like, glorious idea. The, the founder of, of Dot Cloud slash and the Docker project um, and the company Docker. Um, he he combined bind a bunch of very well-known concepts, right? We had containers forever, right? Of course, the mainframe had containers, right? Anyone from IBM will tell you that. Um, uh, we had them in Linux, right? We had vServer for some time that was out of tree with LXC. Um, we were making good progress with, uh, with this concept of isolating processes in namespaces. And containers are just a, a, a word for like a bunch of kernel features, right? uh, um, namespaces, um, C groups for resource control, and um, in, in our case, at least, as Linux for security isolation. Um, in a container, you're sharing the kernel, but you separate the user space in individual namespaces, that then have their own um, dependency tree. It's basically everything from glibc up, as a simplification. You know, it's not the only thing that talks to below, but maybe you have glibc as a base of your user space or another implementation of libc um, or other libraries um, in that container, and then you build your application on top of that, and each application manages its own dependency and its own user space namespace. Um, the nice thing about that is that it, it gives you, without the overhead of a VM, which is a whole machine, right? so both performance and kind of management complexity of having a separate kernel, it gives you the ability to separate the application, give each application its own dependency tree, get out of the dependency hell, and um, you know, it's the same, I mean, it's lightweight, like it has basically, well, it has a performance impact, but it's negative negligible for m almost all applications, few exceptions where you're really latency sensitive, right? Uh, or in other words, like if you, if you have a server in trading where you turn off as Linux in a traditional deployment, then containers probably are not the right thing for you because they use as Linux, right? That kind of level. But like in, in uh, VM, like in average has 10% overhead. Um, you know, this is negligible overhead for anything than the, other than the most sensitive, uh, latency sensitive applications. And, um, it, you know, it, it, the, the first thing it does is it gets at all, us out of dependency hell because um, the application developer can build the application for with the specific dependency tree they need, and they're not going to affect anything else in the system. Right? It doesn't 
solve every problem, right? Because you know, you still have to get the application, the, the libraries you want in the application to work together. But the side effects of multiple applications being affected goes away, and the the um, side effects of you know conflicts, for example, with the operating system, right? Um, and um, you know it's standardized now as as OCI containers, um, as I said, um, initiated by by the Docker project. It gives you frozen binary distribution of the whole application stack, right? And so the, the as I said, we had containers, but the containers were basically a concept of oh, I install everything on the host and then I launch it into a separate namespace. What Docker containers did, they combined the concept of namespaces with packaging, right? So you package it as an aggregate package that you can redistribute. Layering, which is a single inheritance model, I can take a container and customize it, build another container that's a single dependency on top of that. And they included the, the transport protocol, the push and pull model. Right? So they, they solved the problem how to move it from A to B. And the, the, the user space to kernel abstraction actually is stable enough to do this kind of thing. So in, in, in theory, you can, well, in theory, you could break these things. So a newer container on an older kernel, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. But going, moving to newer kernels or different kernels isn't a hard problem in general because so far the Linux kernel to user space interface has been stable enough to do this. Um, there are signatures now. So, so basically, this, this, um, the, the OCI format now is basically at the same level as an RPM or Debian format as a package format just as an aggregation around all the others so a meta package and that gives you a model like what i said about vms earlier in theory you build v you could build a vm and then do an image based you know reproducible deployment where every machine gets the same with containers you actually do that right that's actually how people use containers you build a container once you push it to a registry you pull it to all the machines um, you don't have to use it that way there are other ways to use it but that is the default model how most people use it and that gives you um, this full reproducibility for the whole stack without um, having to, to wait through all these conflicts when you deploy. So it moves the deployment to an, what they call an early binding model, right? Because you bind your dependency tree um, when you deploy, uh, when you build the container. And after that, it's just, you know, in a way, a static binary for all intents and purposes that you move around. And it solves a whole bunch of problems. Um, it Primarily, like if you have CI/CD, if you have a lot of automation, it's extremely useful um, because now you can guarantee that there is no rogue update between your test and your deployment. Right? You can uh, guarantee that you deploy anywhere you want, but you don't have um, you don't have side effects between different services being deployed. And you have all of that without the, the overhead of VMs. And, you know, it's because of the layering model, it's, it's space efficient because, um, you know, it, it, you can dedupe a whole bunch of things in the underlying layers or they, they do that. Um, so it's, you know, it's not the full overhead of having, um, you know, multi gigabyte images, uh, you know, multiple times a day stored somewhere like you have in VMs. Um, now there are different runtimes implementing the OCI model, so it's actually a standard. So Docker is one, Cryo is a Kubernetes-specific one um, that um, that you know implement you know, runs the same containers. So um, I, you know I usually say like when you have two implementations of a standard, it becomes a standard. <laughs> right. um, and it, it it basically combines the best of both worlds, right? Of packaging. And VMs. Right? It gives you an isolation that is a lighter weight alternative to VMs, but it gives you a binary producible um, redistribution of packages. Um, now, in reality, most applications end up consisting of multiple containers, right? Um, because so if you if you have a traditional application, you could put it all in one container, and you know you run um, something like. Uh, um, 
uh, uh, well, you can run system D in there or like in, you know, some watchdog that like manages your, your zombie process and things like that or prevents your zombie processes uh, by killing children if the, if the parent dies and things like that. But, um, but you can have, so you can have multiple processes in a container. Ideally, you, though, you want to have an individual service per container and you want to aggregate multiple containers into an application. But in order to do that, you need a higher level orchestration tool. Um, and that's where Kubernetes comes in. Um, so, um, the... No, I'm going back to that. Um, so, I'm actually not... Yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about Kubernetes yet on the slide, but Kubernetes is basically where, where you describe how you containers connect another solution for that was uh, was swarm um, as a as an orchestrator from docker um, that can put containers together to aggregate into a multi container application um, the yeah so with kubernetes you know the one I want to focus on so kubernetes basically look at it as a system d for a cluster so it's a Container orchestrating cluster manager that um, places containers onto nodes in a cluster, treating the cluster as a default deployment model, and then connects the containers. In reality, so there are scheduling units actually a pod, which is um, it's multiple containers that share um, connections, share, share addresses. Um, so it's, it's containers, pods, and machines, and nodes. Um, and it gives you an abstraction model to define the, the application and its service relationships. Let's say, you know, I have, a, I have a traditional three-tier application, right? Um, so I have a front-end, middle, some logical middleware, and a database backend. So you would describe in a, in a JSON file how they relate to each other, Right, how they scale, how many of each you need, um, how they talk to each other, and then it deploy that, and Kubernetes takes care of starting all of them in the right number and making sure they can talk to each other, independent of what the specific IP addresses of the nodes are and things like that. So it's, a, it's an abstraction up from the physical relationship. So, you know, similar, like if, if you look at it traditionally as single host, right, you can have different processes talk to each other without knowing specifics of the IP addresses, right? Like, you know, with, with local host and, 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 and sockets and pipes and all these good things are for. This is basically the cluster view of that where I can define an application um, independent of what the actual addresses of my cluster are, how many nodes I have, you know, how many app services run on node. If a node dies, it moves around. So it also gives you high availability out of the box, right? It makes sure that the application keeps running. Um, Initially, it was uh, very much focused on stateless web applications. In the meantime, it learned how to deal with stateful applications, things like um, stateful sets. So you can say, oh, this application doesn't want to be kicked around and needs special handling. Um, and the, the, the nice thing with that, it's like it's the next level up from what Linux did. Right? We, we can run the same binary everywhere. Now we can run the same container everywhere, right? We build it once, we can run it in multiple places. With this, we can define an application once and we can run the same definition in multiple places without changing the definition um, to adjust for the changes, you know, the difference in underlying infrastructure. So simple use case is you have one definition, you have a, a test a development cluster, a testing cluster, and a production cluster. The same thing is valid in all three, um, and it's a parameterization of the environment that intersects where it talks to your development you know, data set, your test data set, or your production customer data. You know, it will automatically know which IP addresses, depending on where you deploy it, because Kubernetes takes care of this mapping. Um, so you can now f really move the full application from dev to test to production without having to manually change things or have complex automation rules to adjust that. Um, it's all built around a mutual infrastructure, right? So the idea is that you, you build things, I call it binary producible distribution before, but the next iteration of that is immutable infrastructure. You say in production, 
I cannot change things. Right? So it's all it's images and containers, and I cannot install software in production other than updating the whole image and or rolling it back. Right? So it's very big aggregate transactions you do. Um, nothing where you log into a machine and interactively configure or change things. You do that all from a control plane or when you define things in the development process. Um, so uh, the, the so so you know this is this is all like getting us to a to a point where now um you know, we define full applications right so from compiling on user local we move to compiling individual things in binary packages, installing them. Then we, we defined manifests and had automation tools that do that for us. Um, then we got VMs, which were just bigger computers for the same and reg regressed to updating place. Now with containers and Kubernetes, we have the ability to define full application, deploy it in... in um, in a immutable infrastructure model, right? Um, the problem is that now we want to move things, you know, the, the next thing you want, oh, I want to just install an application, I want to publish applications, and I want to cross clusters, or I want to even, you know, give a predefined application to, an, to a different entity, to a customer. As Red Hat, I want to write a piece of software that's a full service, multi-service application. I want to give that to you and want to make it very easy for you to do. In the Kubernetes model I described before, Kubernetes and Docker, like I, I can have the individual containers in the Docker registry or, or the Quai registry, or you, know, you can build them and put in your, your enterprise registry, and you can deploy them. But the definition, the Kubernetes definition, you basically get from a Git checkout or cut and paste. Right. So you have kind of two different ways here to distribute that. That's not really binary distribution. It works like in a cluster, in a workflow, but what's lacking is, is a transport model or an active model for the full application. You know, the example I usually use is, is free IPA, um, which is an identity management server that Red Hat develops. Um, which you know, it's pretty complex, right? If, if any of you ever try to set up a directory server with Kerberos integration and PKI, uh, you know how painful that is, right? It, it, it's terrible, right? Um, Microsoft has a very nice solution for that. You know, free IPA is an open source alternative to, to that, right? um, roughly. But it, it has a, it's also DNS, right? So it's, it's like the four worst nightmares of a sysadmin in one. Um, and NTP, I forgot that. Like, because you know, you, NTP is what's going to come and bite you, right? Because it breaks Kerberos when it doesn't work. Um, so what you do when you use free IPA is you write DNF, install free IPA server, free IPA server install, it asks you a bunch of questions, like what's your domain name, IP addresses, whatever, if it's Greenfield. And then uh, you have a running instance, and next time you reboot, it's there. Right? It's pretty straightforward. And you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to edit... Um, uh, system the unit files, right? It just does that for you. And it makes sure that like there it's multiple servers, right? It's directory server, it's a Kerberos server, it's a web UI, it's a PKI server, and uh and, and you know NTP and D DNS did I mention that or DNS. Right? And, and, and 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 again it, it it you see how bad that is when the certificates get out of sync because you're like me and you're lazy about updating them in time and they expire. Um, it all breaks terribly still. But, you know, but unless you, you do that and you know, unless you're lazy like me, it's pretty good. If you try to do that with a container, you're totally back to like, oh, in which order do I need to do that? How do I make sure that gets started in the right order? Um, you know, uh, did I install that container? Right? So there is something missing there. There is this glue missing that you know for IPA is totally uh, application specific installer. So it's not a generic solution beyond you know system the unit files, but but that was that that was missing at this point. So the answer there is a combination of things that are converging right now. Um, Kubernetes operators, which are basically active. 
um, sidecars to your application. Um, and then the, the, the open service broker API ends with a playbook bundles in Helm. So Helm, Helm is basically, uh, Helm's charts are descriptive like, oh, these are the services I need. Right? So it's a manifest for multi-service application. Um, operators take that to the next level and um, Ansible playbook bundles are basically uh, um, Ansible playbooks packaged as a container. So you can deploy them with Kubernetes and they talk to the Kubernetes API to automate things in your cluster. And operators are, um, well, the, the, the idea behind it is that, well, I can try to teach Kubernetes how to treat every individual application. Right? But that's probably not going to work. Right? right now, if I define a template for Kubernetes, I define an application, the application might, you know, one of the services in my application is a database. Right? When I install that database, it might be an update, and when I update the database, I might want to update the schema. I need to ho know how to handle that. Right? Traditionally, I write something for that, Right, like the IPA install tool I mentioned, that will, when you update IPA, manage all the schema changes in all their databases, which you know LDAP and whatever. Um, so operators, the idea behind that is that the person writing the application, the people who write the application, are the people who know best how to install the application, how to update the application, how to meter the application, how to validate. Um, you know, to, to uh, validate that the application is monitored the application. Right? So it, it basically is an active component, a, a companion component to your application that gets packaged with the application and provides Kubernetes with an interface to your application to manage the application lifecycle. So now you get to a point where you, I can define an application and you know, the, 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 with operators and Helm charts and playbook bundles, I can wrap it up and then put the whole application in a registry and tell someone, oh, you know, if you want to deploy IPA, just click this button and in an, in an independent of where you're running, you know, whether this is a physical server or in the cloud or in a VM, as long as it's a Kubernetes cluster you're running on, um, this application can be deployed or uh, you know, update lifecycle managed automatically at the level of the full application, not just you know, individually for the database service, the LDAP service, the Kerberos service, and, and so on. So we get to full application um, portability, uh, which, you know, we are wrapping in the Kubernetes service catalog. So um, that's based on the open service broker API. And I don't know where I got this fancy, like, animated, but it's, it's nice. Um, so the idea is basically you get a standard model for building service catalogs for applications to deploy. Um, this is, it's an upstream project on service broker APIs. Originally, um, I think a pivotal um, uh, API um, they used. It's very simple. It just defines um, catalog, um, uh, provision, unprovision, bind, unbind. But it lets you... Um, it, you know, it, it gives you the standard interface and, oh yeah, I want to install this application in my cluster now, or I want to bind to this service in my cluster. So you have this abstraction and then it calls um, the, the operator and, and playbook, playbook through a standard API and then you have the, your application running and you can interact with it. So, um, so that gives us three major use cases how to run containers, right, the, to summarize all of this right? the, the thing I'm focusing most on is a, is a fully orchestrated multi-container application that it would run on a Kubernetes cluster right? you can still do loosely orchestrated containers let's say you know I just have one application in a container I treat it like a, a just an image I want to deploy in a machine and uh, started locally um, or I can still do a pet container which is like I'm I'm doing all the sins of before I log into my container and do interactive things in the container which is not recommended but sometimes there are reasons to do that um, 
you know, in development usually or you know one off things just so you can you, you can have your own namespace for an application. So I do that on my Raspberry Pis, where I play around with my home automation uh, software because you know that nothing works together in the same namespace there. So you just um, because nothing. And it's also like no device is similar. I don't have an advantage from um, copying containers around. So there, I do that today. I probably should stop doing it because it really makes them pets. Right. Um, loosely orchestrated, you would build it somewhere once, but then you you deploy individual containers and just start them. They're not multi-container applications. Um, and we use it, for example, in, in immutable infrastructure for drivers. Um, so we, we, we privileged containers that operate, actually are extensions of the host are an example where we use this. Right? They're not necessarily run by Kubernetes because they're, they're just wrappers to have um, the namespacing and, and, and the the isolation of the dependency tree from the rest of the host um, but they are not they are not part of an application and then fully orchestrated applications where where we see the future going so that gives us like a new structure of the of the stack and i 'm using the reddit example here, but that 's pretty much how all the container platforms look. Um, so you, you have the infrastructure layer and application platform, which provides it's basically Kubernetes plus some things around it, um, and then some management tools, some developer tools, and then two ecosystems: prepackaged applications so with things like that have Helm charts, operators, things like that, um, and the developer content ecosystem. That is the traditional individual component, npm, pypy, this kind of stuff. The difference is like the things on the left are download to develop, right, and to download to build. They're basically they they are used by people who compile software it's not always true because it might be an interpreted language but it's it's you know people who write import something and then do something with that and write ideally write tests and see whether it works and they control that that what goes into a container and on the side on the right hand you have the package service ecosystem which is the what people use who want to just install and run things, right? That's the deploy my database cluster, deploy my um, security monitoring application, um, deploy the applications these other guys built, right? So that's where you do the handover. Um, and you know, in our case, we you know, we have some physical infrastructure or virtual infrastructure or public cloud we position openshift as this abstraction and uh, you know, in a way it's a new iteration of the concept of the operating system right it's built it's an extension of linux into the the full cluster with the service um, concept and that takes care of i think you know it provides a service catalog it provides service routing um the other concepts in there that connect endpoints automatically so your application doesn't need to take care of that on its own, um, logging, um, uh, automation of the cluster itself. Um, and then on top of that, you, you have you know, packaged services, you have middleware, um, you have the runtimes. And so in, in, in effect, you know, Linux shows up twice here. Right? It shows up as the host layer in the middle box, right? and then as the user space in every single of the other boxes. So going back to my first page, which is like there are two views on the operating system. We basically draw a big line through that and say, oh, the operating system actually is two things. It's the host, the hardware operating system, and then it's the user space operating system inside the container. And we basically build everything around this abstraction and cluster that out. Um, you know, the idea is that it's open, right? It's A, it's all open source, and B, even you know, when you buy it from any of the vendors, you have choice. Um, you, know, you basically outsource the maintenance to someone who does it as a core business, um, and you, you buy this abstraction, but you still have full choice on which ecosystem you, you pull from. Um, this gives you an alternative to the vertical integration of the, of the proprietary cloud, right, which at the end, you know, from my point of view, resembles a mainframe, right, you know, leased hardware, um, black box services, and um, 
you know, once you put your data in, you will never get it back out or it's going to be very expensive. Right? Um, so they, they reinvented the mainframe and uh, the Kubernetes basically is the, is the, like the, the way that Linux was the alternative neutral runtime for an open ecosystem against um, the mainframe and, and the proprietary Unix world. Kubernetes with containers as an extension of Linux becomes the alternative to the proprietary cloud, giving you an abstraction layer or the ability to to run your your application with the same level of service abstraction um, on your own right, or move the same application across. Um, some other trends that are interesting here, AI, um, well, it was in the intro, it, like I moved from this job to thinking about how to use AI. Um, what I find very interesting is that everyone, when I go to the vendors who do AI platforms, data science workflows, Kubernetes already has taken over that space. So the, the, most, of, most of the people building AI platforms right now are building them on Kubernetes. So everyone I talk to basically builds the same stack there. Everyone, it's Kafka and Kubernetes and then like things around that, um, which I find very interesting. Um, and it inherits a lot of the, the DevOps workflow that Kubernetes, most of the Kubernetes-based platforms support, which I didn't go into detail on. Um, and IoT uh, is an interesting... Um, interesting right now, the, like, so devices are very different, right? But, but you have, like, devices are growing, and I see indications that devices are moving to a cluster model as well. So cluster, the, the cluster is a computer, is something I see happening in IoT as well. Plus, you know, when you go into bigger gateways and like this aggregation from from sensors to smarter devices, they're growing as well. And they're looking for right now. They're lacking a, a consistent application deployment model. Um, my bet would be that Kubernetes also becomes the default for that. But uh, I just want to bet saying, uh, you know, I said in August or something that a year from now, no one will, will uh, cringe when I say a VM is just a special case of a container. I just uh, collected the price for that one. Um, and I'll get to the proof point. But so I'll, I'll do another bet like a year from now, Kubernetes will be, or something based on this, what I talk about with Kubernetes and operators on, will be, the, will be a deployment model for I, IoT applications, not to the sensor, not to the small devices, but for the uh, aggregation devices and smarter gateways and uh, as a distributed compute concept that's, that's implicit in there. Um, another thing, uh, the infrastructure. So in my, the picture I had earlier, infrastructure was a separate world. However, Kubernetes is also taking over the infrastructure right now. Um, Kubert is a project that, um, that is basically wrapping VMs in containers and have them orchestrated by Kubernetes. So you can run, so this makes sense when you're running by default containers on bare metal, right? which makes sense if you don't need virtualization. But you have some things where you still want to use virtualization, either um, you know, three, there's three use cases, adv additional security isolation, because containers are weaker in security than VMs, right? VMs has an emulated hardware layer to um, prevent aggression. Um, or you have an operating system that like is separate, a different kernel or different um, uh, uh, tuning parameters, right? You want a, a specific kernel. So there are reasons why VMs still make sense, right? Containers do not replace VMs. They just, um, they just replace VMs in cases where you should not have used a VM to begin with because you're solving a different problem. Um, KubeWord by, uh, gives you a VM that's orchestrated by Kubernetes, which is really nice. So you only have one orchestration layer across both use cases. And I uh, think Reddit container native storage is where your storage is now orchestrated by Kubernetes. So it's, uh, it's cluster in a container on top. So the infrastructure suddenly moves from underneath Kubernetes to above Kubernetes. And Kubernetes becomes really like the, we, we call it the meta kernel. Right, which of course isn't true. It's a meta system D, but everyone hates system D, so we say it's a meta kernel. Um, so conclusions. Um, so I think uh, OCI containers are now part of the default Linux experience. Right? They are there. They're not going to go away. Um, 
the default deployment model is shifting from, from a single machine to a cluster, right, which is a real big like shift in, in perspective. Right? Traditionally, we look at a single machine and then the cluster is a special case. Going forward, the cluster is going to be the default. Individual machines are going to be the exception. Um, and yeah, Kubernetes is the default orchestrator for that. There are always others. Right? BSD is still around, right? There are always others. Um, and we'll see, like, so for, for the, the the Linux distribution packaging will not expand in like with the complexity. Will not try to scale with the complexity of these modern stacks because you can't package seven hundred thousand npm packages in Debian packages and RPMs and you know think you are doing something useful. Uh, it just so there are other ways to address that. So native upstream packages are also going to stay around, and we're going to use them. And containers are how we deal with that. Um, and uh, yeah, the full application portability is, is the key to not get sucked into like a new mainframe model, which you know is a whole different debate why that would be a bad thing, but we are not going to go there. Um, what's next? So where does it leave the desktop? I really want to see a, a Kubernetes-based desktop. I haven't found anyone to do that yet. Um, but that would be awesome. Why? Uh, because I think that for most people, the desktop is a front end for the cloud, the hybrid cloud for the clusters. And we want the, the same application model across all of them. Right now, we, right now they're diverging. Uh, you know, and they, they're diverging for the first time in Linux history in a way, right? Traditionally for Linux, Linux server and desktop were the same thing. Right? The, the difference was that the, the desktop was a server with a person sitting in front. And that's not the case right now. I think that's a problem, and I think that we need to ad address that for a whole bunch of reasons, similar to the IoT thing. Um, yeah, other more orchestrated, like, uh, what is the singularity and Mesos? And all this. Yes, there are special cases where you need other things, but the default is going to be Kubernetes. And then, yeah, the problem... Uh, Data portability is uh, is the next big problem we have to solve because right now if all your data is in one cloud then and they charge you for getting out of there, nothing of this will help you um, to save you. Um, that's it. Um, this is an awesome picture. It's called the Internet. I, uh, there's a link where I found it, so if you want to... Um, give some kudos to the artist. Um, and uh, we all know that unicorns are real. And this one can even snort fire. So thank you very much. I hope this was interesting and entertaining. Yeah. And if you have questions, I don't know if you have time for questions, but the microphone is being turned on, so we have time for questions. Excellent. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, so I was wondering from an ops perspective, going back to the slide where you had uh, APB and Helm, say um, you know another Hartley or a different issue where I need to upgrade my fleet uh, across the board, um, lacking say Chef or Ansible or something like that, would APB or Helm in your mind uh, fill that void? So. Yes, that will fill the void. Um, the and it, right now they're converging, so I don't know exactly how it's gonna play out. Um, the way I look at it is so Helm and operators and APBs are converging, and um, they'll give you a f one like a definition for an application. So you publish. The full application, it might use external services or it's completely self-contained with, for example, embedded database, right? And that's one unit. And then you have your cluster as the, uh, and, and director as the other unit. They kind of live independently, right? You update the cluster, um, which a good part of the security issues are going to be on that layer, right? Yeah, on the, you know, depending on where the Easter egg is, like in your build tool chain or in the, in the platform. Um, and the cluster takes 
care of applications moving around, right? So if you are like rolling updates in the cluster, things like that are just happening then on as part of the cluster. New application, you know, nodes are going to be evacuated, application moves around, node is updated, application it's moved back to the node. Right? So you have this rolling update model. The application itself, um, the the so the CI C D pipeline that's Every of these platforms has a pipeline like that. That pipeline will take care of rebuilding your application for the okay. security issues there and there. And then you'll have some automation definition around under which, like, can you automatically deploy after testing? Do you, and, 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 like, Kubernetes has this um, A B deployment models, and you, so, so you can build pretty smart um, processes around that. So, what's the role of Ansible and, and, you know, in that, so you still use something like Ansible or or Chef or uh, you know Puppet around that, though, right? Because let's say, um, you know, if you have multiple clusters, you use that to tie it together and tell them, oh, you all need to update this, right? Um, or oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, so uh, restating it. Uh, it sort of boils down to continually rebuilding your base containers and rebuilding your apps, even if you're not doing code changes, just to make sure you've got your latest security patches applied. So yes, you will. The the containers will be rebuilt every time there is a security fix to any of the components that you have in any of the containers, whether they come from an underlying container you inherit, in which case you just get a notification that the, con the base container is updated. And then you rebuild your layers, or, and build could be just repackaging, <laughs> or could be recompiling, depending on. Um, in, mo in many cases, you've got to recompile because it's integrated, but you might have your build tool chain outside, and you're just packaging, and then um, that. And I, so, in a way, it's an, it's, a, it's an interesting trade off, right? The argument for the traditional model is that, oh, I have to do less build operations. Right, because I can update in in the production system, but then you you have the in the production system the risk of that of inherited changes. If you do it the the model, you have to rebuild anyways, and you run it through CI. I think you the end result is going to be more stability. Um, but you know it's it's a very big change, right? You're building much more. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great talk. So I work with a bunch of what I'd call more pure software engineers that don't have a lot of experience in DevOps. Mm -hmm. And they're very comfortable doing what I think you characterized as um, loosely orchestrated containerization. So Docker Compose, put everything up. They've, people where I work have had a lot of friction shifting from deploy everything as a single Docker image into Kubernetes. Hmm. Um, Kubernetes has a tremendous number of knobs and levers, and the learning curve is very steep. Do you have any recommendations for how someone who doesn't have a DevOps background but is comfortable with Docker can transition their applications from a monolithic Docker Compose into something more orchestrated a la Kubernetes? So what worked for me is um, so in, in, in OpenShift we have this tool called source to image, which you just point it to your Git repo and it does something and then you have your thing like in a container. And I, I couldn't, like I was like, what is this thing doing? Um, and uh, what worked for me is to initially basically just build my containers outside of the, like the, Platform in OpenShift in that case, and just push them like just do the Kubernetes definition, the template based on, or you know, it was an OpenShift template which like is similar to Helm but different. It's parallel. You could do a Helm shit, but it basically take a pre pre built thing, then you know put the Docker file in and like ease into it like that. Use it more as a cluster manager first. And then, and then, like, get comfortable with the other ways of using it. Um, once you get used to it, it's it's much easier. 
Um, but it removes you a lot from the traditional Linux experience. I, you know, I, I find that challenging too. Great. So. Thank you. Uh, there was uh, some slide that had to do with um, using stuff like Ansible inside the container versus using, I think it, the word was, I mean word, the, the, what was said was uh, API on like a lower level. Yeah. Uh, no, which slide? Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was the different use cases for containers, right? Um, yeah, one? there it is. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering what the difference between those two is. So, on the right, like the, um, the pet container is basically, so it, most people say it's crazy. I think it's valid, but that's one of the things where my employer will claim deniability. Um, or most people there anyway, Phil. It's a, so, do you use a container simply to separate namespaces so you can have multiple instances of the user space mm -hmm. that just don't see each other? Mm -hmm. right? In which case you would then you know, maybe even run SSH inside the container or, or like exec into it to do interactive tasks in the container, mm -hmm. right? And then you automate that with Ansible. I've seen that in, so in, in most cases that makes no sense because you're inheriting all the downsides of the, like it's, it's basically like a VM, right. right? It's kind of LXD, right? Mm -hmm. So you're using container as a lightweight VM. Um, so the only gain you have is that you're not running a separate kernel and so you know you 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 ten per or ten percent performance overhead you get rid of kind of right? um, the advantage like if you, I'm using that in in like IoT experiments mm -hmm. right where I want to be able to have independent user space and I can't run a VM and I don't want to have more devices right? it's just a simplification and in that case I you know, you actually run Ansible execute Ansible in each uh, individual container like it was an independent VM. And how is <laughs> Ansible usually run? Well, so you would, like, in the other models, you're not looking into, any con into the container, mm -hmm. right? The container is basically, in production, a black box. You only look in the container when you build it, and then you deploy it. But you okay. never, you never interactively or in, with scripts go inside the container. Okay. You, you only... You only talk you to things build that, time. Like, yeah, at build time you go into the container, but then you just operate on the container and treat it as a static binary. Okay, thanks. Daniel, thank you for the great talk. Um, I want to go back to your title, A Graveyard's Worst Nightmare, and I'm trying to, I mean, is, is the nightmare resolved, or is there <laughs> a nightmare at every step of this journey? Well, um, I think it's the it's a right it's a it's a it's a big change. And this like when I when I started this, it was about the time when uh, Debian was forked because of System D. Yep. And like, if you haven't forked because of System D, you're going to fork because of Kubernetes. Was the logic, the joke behind it? It's a it's a bit old. I, I <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> so, continuing from the question before, I've used Docker Compose for a simple Flask application. Basically, yeah. it's a there's a container that does Python. There's a container that does Postgres. And I just do Docker Compose, and they both co-op, yeah. and everything's good. How do I run Kubernetes on my laptop? And so, that would be the same as. So there's a project called Minikube, or um, we have a, a downstream version, uh, Mini Shift, which gives you um, basically a, a single node cluster installed to try that out. So I can like system control and start Minikube. Yeah, it's a it's a tool like so we run mini mini shift install and so if you look for mini shift that 
that's a good starting point. And it uses um, OpenShift Origin, which is the like the Fedora equivalent of OpenShift. Which, uh, so the way that works for uh, uh, like, it, it's kind of an interesting. Like the Linux distribution, right? There are aggregations of many individual projects. Right? And so the Kubernetes distributions, Kubernetes itself is like one piece, but the platforms all add additional things like Jenkins integration and you know other operator frameworks and things like that. So Minishift is basically a, an easy like to try environment for that whole workflow. So it's more than Kubernetes, or uh, you can use Minikube, which is the upstream version. But wouldn't there be like just hardware limitations? I think like a normal laptop, but well, for like for it's for development, right? For playing, it's not for for production, right? But that usually works on on a normal laptop. Mm -hmm. okay. Daniel, thank you very much for presentation. My question is about <clears throat> configuration management that you cannot actually put inside of the container, like credentials, logins, and passwords. Uh, can you just put a few words on that? So, so yeah, that's an interesting. I don't think that uh, that. So it makes sense to put application defaults in a container, but I would only put things in a container that you would compile into the program. Look at it as really, I, I think a static binary is the best mm -hmm. analogy. Everything else should be parameterized from outside the container. Um, and there was like, like before Kubernetes, there were like um, a bunch of patterns being developed um, or before Kubernetes took over, for example, having a standard slash ETC subdirectory mount model that automatically gets mounted in your container in, in a, a wrapper tool um, to separate configuration from the container build. Um, it's tempting to do it. I think it's not a good idea because you know, you're distributing too much in something that I would agree with you, and, and then like we'll just go like one step further and say like if you have a passwords, if you have like important integrations password, for example, for with like TransUnion or mm -hmm. other really third parties, which you will never push to container. Yeah. Like, what, what will be your like brief like high level design for actually delivering the parameters to container? Um. So. Uh, the, the the default method in in docker is environment variables right um there are i think kubernetes uses a mix of environment variables and etcd mm -hmm. um i i've used a lot of like mounted directories for which like it depends what you're doing um Mounted directories often are a, a viable way to do that in a cluster, right? Because you, it, it, if it's just, if it's simple things, it parameter is like a password. Then the standard way works, right? With mm -hmm. environment variables. Um, when you have complex configuration, especially things you want to write to, then I would mount it from a from a storage persistent storage model. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, as far as handling persistent storage goes within Kubernetes ecosystem, uh, what do you see as like the leading slash best way to handle that? Um, so uh, there is a standard interface for that, right? Um, which uh, uh, CSI is that? Yeah, yeah CSI is that, and. Uh, beyond that, I don't really have a strong opinion. We have our, we sell a solution, well, two, depending on what you're doing. But but um, uh, yeah, so the, the uh, container native storage cluster that I mentioned is a solution for that that is integrated well. But ultimately, I think anything that that f like buys into into um, uh, uh, CSI is is good. I also see. I still see. A, well, Kubernetes itself doesn't manage infrastructure, right? It's it's 
It, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, debate. I, I have sometimes read it. Where people say Red is an infrastructure company. I say, no, no, we are not. We're an application company. We, nothing we do actually manages infrastructure, which is not quite true anymore, but back in the day that was true. And then, what do you mean? It's, an, it's, it's RHEL. Well, RHEL can't even auto detect your, your storage if that's in a, in a real storage system, because it doesn't actually talk to the infrastructure. It doesn't, you need to install a third party tool from the hardware vendor to actually know what the storage is doing. And that Kubernetes is similar, right? It doesn't, like it manages Linux, it runs on Linux, but it doesn't do more than Linux and infrastructure management at large. It's a bit oversimplifying. And um, what we see is a lot of OpenStack being used as the infrastructure management, which is kind of interesting. So traditionally, people think of OpenStack as virtual machines. But it's not all it does, right? It actually can do bare metal. And that is a combination that's really interesting. And you know, through that, also see a lot of OpenStack. So Cinder is still relevant in that space. Um, and I think it's a bit in flux, like how that will end up. Um, there's also a project to orchestrate the OpenStack services with Kubernetes, right? So it's all uh, a bit confusing right now so ultimately i think C csi is the the interface and then you can decide you will end up with a mix of hyper converged so like cns would be hyper converged storage running on the same cluster or dedicated so we right now we use for um kind of ad hoc storage um small storage we use uh, uh, our cluster container native storage CNS, too many acronyms. Um, and for like uh, for AI data, analytics data, we use a dedicated Ceph cluster. Right? So it's it's not a, it's not a complete shift. Uh, it depends on your use case. Thank you. I was wondering about um, how you go about setting up your CI/CD for uh, stage to QA to prod with respect to um, promotion of the same artifact through those stages. Do you say only do master branch deployments? And even with that, how do you know that your pulling latest in production is, has already been blessed? So you're stretching a bit beyond my... <laughs> <laughs> my personal scope of like up to date experience um well, uh, so i i don't know okay fair well thank you very much well,